I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine, one of the most remarkable men I've ever met. He is a naturalist by trade, and he's written a score of books, powerful and poetic, revealing his profound understanding of the natural world. He's a very wise man, a modern-day prophet, and his life is a real adventure story, culminating in an epic battle to save our planet. His name is Ed Wilson, and his life story is the story of life. Ed Wilson is um, a magic name to many of us working uh, in the natural world for two reasons. First, he is a towering example of a specialist, a world authority. Uh, nobody in the world has ever known as much as Ed Wilson about ants. He's a scientist with over 400 published papers, but he writes like a poet. What sets him apart is his unified picture of life. He explores the continuum that extends from subatomic particles and chemical interactions to consciousness and culture. The wellspring for this unity of knowledge began with his boyhood adventures in Alabama. Nature soon cast an everlasting spell. I had the great good fortune of spending a large part of my boyhood wandering through beautiful mixed woods of South Alabama. You can see it's so rich in living creatures that I soon was picking up on it, looking at every frog and, and lizard and kind of plants and thin insects that I could find. I got a lot of indirect encouragement from my parents, mainly because they gave me freedom. They didn't mind that I was going through what I like to call my little savage period. When I'm now grown up, uh, I'm still basically a boy, <laughs> but I'm a grown up naturalist now. And uh, it, it takes a little effort for me to realize that I and people like me see the world in a different way from others. I see it as a universe of immense diversity. Like many boys, he had a passion for fishing. One of my favorites was the pinfish, which has these sharp spines in the dorsal fin. Easy to catch, uh, but I was enthusiastically yanking them up out of the water one after the other when one accidentally came in the spine hit me in the eye. I subsequently became blind in that eye. But that combined with my inability to hear very well in the upper register, so I can't hear bird song, meant that, well, I sure wasn't going to be an expert on birds when I got older. So I turned uh, kind of automatically to looking at little things that I can see when holding between my thumb and forefinger insects and other small creatures. And I became an entomologist, a student of insects. There's the question of why did I pick ants? Uh, you know, why not butterflies or whatever? And the answer is that they're so abundant. They're easy to find, and they're easy to study, and they're so interesting. They have uh, social habits that differ from one kind of ant to the next. You know, each kind of ant has almost a, the equivalent of a different human culture. So each species is uh, a wonderful object to study in itself. In fact, I, I honestly can't, cannot understand why most people don't study ants. By choosing an insect with so many different species and such highly organized societies, he had unwittingly set off down a path that would determine his own evolution as a biologist. At the age of 13, he was the first person to identify a new invasive species in Alabama, the red fire ant from South America. Later, when he was still in college, the state of Alabama asked him to write a report on the fire ant invasion. In 1951, he came to study at Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology, and he's been there ever since. 
Here is a nest of the infamous fire ant. Mound nest of something with something like 200,000 uh, vicious, stinging little workers in it. And I'm going to demonstrate now why it's called a fire ant. Now, don't do this at home. First, I'll scrape this off and get them coming up. And uh, pretty soon, those ants are boiling out of there, biting mad. They're ready uh, to uh, uh, sting and defeat any enemy that comes in. And I'm going to make myself the enemy just for a few seconds. So here we go. All right, now if you look, uh, you'll see a lot of them beginning to pause and sting my hand. Each one of those stings feels like the touch of a hot needle. And now, pardon me, I'm going to get rid of these ants in a hurry. When M.C. Davis and Sam Shine established Nagosi Plantation near the towns of Freeport and Bruce in central Walton County, they had more than large-scale conservation of Northwest Florida's biological wealth in mind. They knew they also had to teach people about the area's historic biodiversity and the important role it plays in sustainability. Nagosi Plantation a 50,000-acre private conservation initiative is the site of the E.O. Wilson Biophilia Center. It is through this spectacular learning facility that this mission and education will be fulfilled. At the Biophilia Center, students of all ages will gaze into the eyes of nature. Here, they will experience the awakening of their own biophilia. We're going to encourage and, and insist that everybody get out, walk it, wait it, swim it, and crawl through it. The piecing together of large parts of land that are going to be invaluable in the future for conservation, for science, for education. You're going to change behavior. The only reason you'll do that voluntarily is through education. One of the things I did when I was 13 years old, I found the first colony of fire ants ever found in America. It got off a boat, you know, mm -hmm. coming up from uh, South America. And it was just getting started, so even at 13, I made a scientific discovery. Nature has her way of doing things that often man wants to mess up, but we're learning the lessons that we got to start listening to Mother Nature. As an educator, a lifelong educator, I've always thought that our field experiences with our students are the most important. It's the ones that stick with them the best, and that's where true learning takes place. In school, growing up, I, every once in a while, you know, you, you'd have a great teacher who actually let you participate and interact. And I felt that I learned through osmosis. I forgot all about that I was studying or learning, and I was having so much fun and being fascinated with it. And, and that's really the atmosphere that we're going to create here. And our, our goal is that with this, that every child will leave our system feeling a little bit like a naturalist. I believe that as time passes, especially uh, having uh, wild areas like this, where you can actually see the world as it exists apart from humanity, is going to be a very large uh, attraction for people that they will count it high on their list of things that improve the quality of life. This is such a, an arduous task, this trying to save biodiversity and, and, and we all know we can only do that through our children and so our children can only do it if they're armed with the knowledge and the passion. So that's that's a daunting task, so it takes a big team. I mean, it takes parents, it takes scientists and educators, entrepreneurs, and the government. So all together we can collaborate and make such a team, and, and this can happen, and, and it will happen. It is not our goal to transform all students into scientists. Rather, we seek to guide children to awakening through which a love of life is born. With live animal exhibits, interactive displays, programs, outdoor classrooms, and nature trails, children leave this center feeling at least a little like naturalists. And this facility will reach well beyond its walls with cyber-enabled programs, 
links for students to communicate with scientists, teacher training programs, and worldwide access to learn about biodiversity. As today's youth grow into leaders, teachers, businessmen, politicians, and more, their decisions will be influenced by the environmental education they received here. We would like to build on each person's innate propensity for this love of life, our affinity and fascination for the wonders of nature that is part of our consciousness as human beings. This is Biophilia.